All right, well, this morning we're going to be uh, looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And this may seem somewhat familiar, although we haven't seen this text for I don't know how long. Um, I've never preached on it, as far as I can recall. But um, in chapter 13, there was a very similar passage. And so we, we looked at the Sabbath a little bit there, but we want to look at it again and be encouraged as to, you know, how gracious it is that God has given to us a Sabbath. And then look at what we're supposed to be doing on the Sabbath at the Pharisees as, as an example, in a good example in a certain way, but a bad example in, in another way. So let me read the text and let's, um, let's again, be encouraged through this to, um, to use this day in the way that the Lord has uh, given, us, given it to us to use, you know, for what He intends it for. So, uh, let's read beginning in verse 1, Luke chapter 14. It happened that when He went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching Him closely. And there in front of Him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke uh, to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply uh, to this. Well, again, may the Lord bless this short passage uh, to our uh, edification, to our uh, being built into the image of Jesus this morning. May he make it a blessing to us. Now, as I've already mentioned this morning, Luke records for us another healing that Jesus did on the Sabbath. Uh, he was invited to the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Isn't it interesting that Jesus would go into the house of his enemies in order to minister to them? Now, this was likely after synagogue, after synagogue worship. This was on the Sabbath, but he was invited over for a meal, likely to have dinner, and he went. Now, he was invited to dinner, but we know that that was likely a, a pretense because there was really, with very few exceptions, an ulterior motive whenever a Pharisee was involved in these invitations. Usually, it was that they might be able to find some reason to accuse Jesus, and that certainly appears to be the case here. Luke tells us in verse 1, they were watching him closely. And as a matter of fact, they had even prepared a test for him. We read in verse 2, there was in front of him, or there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, dropsy is, is a term that I've heard before, but is a little bit unfamiliar with. Maybe some of us are unfamiliar, but it basically means the man had edema, okay? He, he was swollen. His arms and legs were retaining fluid, uh, likely because there was something wrong with his heart. But it was severe enough to be debilitating, enough for this man to want to be healed of this particular affliction. Now, it is possible that he had heard that Jesus was going to be in the house, uh, that he was there in this place. Um, it's, it's likely that he came hoping to be healed, but it's more likely that this had meeting had really been set up by the Pharisees to give them the grounds to accuse him. But either way, our Lord Jesus knew what was in their hearts, even though, again, he took all of our limitations as a man upon himself. He still had access to knowledge that others could not know communicated to him by the Holy Spirit. We read in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 24 through 25, with regard to Jesus' reaction to the Jews around him, but Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. I mean, Jesus knew why the Pharisees invited him over. He knew why this man was here. He knew what, what they wanted. So instead of waiting for their accusation to come to him after he heals the man, he decided to be proactive on this occasion. And he asked them, you know, the, to the, the Pharisees and the lawyers, the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, I think you know their answer to this question. They believed 
that to do so would be work. And to work on the Sabbath would be to break God's law. So they would obviously say no. When Jesus earlier healed the woman on the Sabbath, the one who had been bent over double for 18 years, and the Lord released her from that burden and from that bond, the synagogue official said to the crowd, because he disagreed with Jesus, in Luke 13, 14, this is from the previous chapter, there are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Well, that was the mindset of all the Pharisees. They believed this was wrong. But rather than answering Jesus' question, they kept silent because they wanted Jesus to do it. They wanted him to break the law. They wanted him to heal this man of course, so they could accuse him. But Jesus didn't, well, I should say, Jesus didn't disappoint them. That's exactly what he did. In verse 4 we read, he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. But before they could say anything, Jesus said to them in verse 5, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Again, Jesus using his wisdom to really expose their hypocrisy. Which one of them would not do this? I mean, which one of us would not do this? If our child was in danger, which one of us wouldn't do what we needed to do in order to save that child or even an animal that we cared about when we could save them, even if it was on the Sabbath day? Now, they couldn't deny that they would do the same thing. I mean, to deny it would be, of course, hypocritical. And so, basically, Jesus put a sock in their mouths, so to speak. He muzzled them. He silenced them. They had egg on their face. They remained silent. Now, last time, you know, when Jesus essentially did the same thing with the healing of the woman, we, we noted that Jesus there was putting the clever to shame, and he certainly did that again here. This morning, I want us to draw two additional lessons from this particular encounter, and they're basically these. First of all, that we are to love others by protecting their lives, even on the Sabbath. I mean, that issue is addressed here. But secondly, we need to see that our love needs to be a consistent love. Now, the fact that the Pharisees would deliver or would save their children or their animals on the Sabbath, I mean, that's just an example, a reminder that we need to do that. But the fact they wouldn't help the man, they didn't want Jesus to help the man, is an example of the inconsistency of their love. So these are the two things I want us to look at. First of all, we are to love others by protecting their lives even on a Sabbath day. Now, we need to recognize that not everything the Pharisees did was necessarily wrong. The Pharisees often did right things, although it was always for the wrong motive. If we were to ask Jesus whether they would be doing the right thing if they saved their children or their animals, if they fell down in a well on the Sabbath, what do you think Jesus would say? Of course, that's the right thing to do. Jesus tells us the Sabbath in Mark 2.27 was actually made for us. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. God never intended the Sabbath to harm us, but rather to be a blessing to our souls. I mean, what is the Sabbath day? The, the word means day of rest, the day of resting. It's a day that God gives us off. Off from what? From work, right? From the work that we have to do the other six days so that we can do what we need to do most. Now, what is the thing we need to do more than anything else? What do you think it would be? We need to spend time with God. Right? We need to fellowship with Him. We need to worship Him. Now, that's what God commands us to do on the, on the Sabbath day. But why does He command us to do that? Is it because He needs our worship? Well, no, because God is independent. God does not need us. He did not need to create us. Uh, he doesn't depend on His creatures for anything. God is perfectly blessed and happy, even if none of us actually existed. He does not need us to worship Him, okay? But He knows we need to worship Him, right? Because that is how we get blessed. You know, God doesn't really gain anything by our worshiping Him. 
we are the ones who actually gain. And what we gain is spiritual strength. Now, sometimes we might look at the Sabbath or all the commandments as a burden. But nothing is really a burden when love is involved, especially pure love. I mean, remember when, you know, you, you met somebody that you really cared about, perhaps the person you married, and how easy it was to do nice things for them because you love them, right? Love motivates you to, to give and to, to want to please that person. Well, that's exactly how it is with God. When we love Him, what He calls us to do is not a burden because we know it's pleasing to Him. That's really what John means when he says in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, and I think it's the love of God in us as well as the love of God that we express toward Him, that we keep His commandments. And notice he says, His commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome because we delight in doing them because we love God. And what's true of all the commandments is certainly true of the Sabbath day. If we were to ask Adam and Eve uh, when they were perfect in the garden, whether they look forward to this day that God had made at the end of the week for them to rest, what do you think they would have said? Yes, okay. It's the best day of the week. We really look forward to this day. And even after the fall, and their subsequent redemption, we still see them worshiping the Lord on the last day of the week, at the end of days, bringing their sacrifices to the Lord. Now, they may not have been doing it quite as ardently as they were before because they had a perfect heart before in the garden, but they still loved the Lord, and they still wanted to worship Him. And, of course, we should want to worship Him as well, and we should love the day that God has given us to do this because our week is often so busy. I mean, don't you find your week to be busy? It's a struggle to find time, the time that we would like to spend with God, to have fellowship with Him. And we understand that if we don't spend time with Him, that we're going to grow spiritually weaker. We're going to cool off. We're not going to have the ardent love that we need so that the commandments are not a burden to us. I mean, haven't you found that to be true? When you withdraw from the Lord and you don't spend time with Him, haven't you found that serving the Lord becomes more of a burden and it gets harder and harder to be able to spend time with Him? Our hearts need the fuel that comes, the fuel of the Holy Spirit that comes through communion with God, the communion that we can only have in His Word and in prayer, which is what we do here, and, of course, in worship. Really, that's the way the Lord has made things. He hasn't, you know, given us, I guess you might say, uh, an energizer battery, you know, that just goes and goes and goes without needing to be replaced. I mean, in a certain sense, He has because the Spirit of God's never going to go out in our hearts. We're always going to have that love for Him if we have the Spirit of God in our hearts in the saving way. But we have more like a rechargeable battery that needs to be put in the battery pack, you know, a recharger every time you're done using it or they're going to go flat. We need to be coming to the Lord continuously to be recharged. God made it that way so that we would come to Him more often, so that we would gain more of His Holy Spirit, so that we would have a stronger love, so that with a strong love, our sin would be more restrained. You know, the stronger our love is, the harder it is to sin. It's never hard to sin. Okay, it's always easy to sin, but it gets a little bit easier to resist it the more we actually love the Lord. When we look at the life of uh, David, you know, the king, and we see that he was a man after God's own heart and all the things he did for the Lord, we, we say, man, I'd really like to be like him. But then we see him doing something quite unexpectedly. We see him stealing another man's wife, committing adultery, and then murdering the husband in order to cover up his sin. And we ask the question, how did David get into that condition? Well, his sin was kept in check by his fellowship with God, but when his fellowship with the Lord weakened and he was subjected to a very strong and overwhelming temptation, he fell away from the Lord. Since love is our strongest defense, we need fellowship with the Lord. Well, the Lord gave us the Sabbath. He gave us the Lord's Day so that we might have that communion with Him. But now, getting back to the, the more particular point in our text, in giving us this day with Him, 
to show our love and devotion to Him, which again helps us rather than God by keeping the, the first four commandments on this day. He never actually meant for us to stop keeping the other six. Sometimes we think you put the other six on hold, I'm just going to focus on God today. But that's not the case. We're supposed still to keep them all, right? To love our neighbor as well as God. To love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now the sixth commandment tells us not, not only that we're not to take life unjustly, but that we are to preserve life. Remember, there's always a positive and a negative to a commandment. If it says don't do one thing, it's telling us at the same time to do the opposite good thing, right? So we are not to take life unjustly, but we are to preserve life. And that's what the Pharisees would do, okay? When they would rescue their children or even their animals on the Sabbath, okay? Love dictates that we save life on the Sabbath, that we should do the same thing. I mean, on the Sabbath day, we are to protect our own lives by making sure we take care of our needs. You know, we clothe ourselves, clean ourselves, we fix food for ourselves. I mean, the Pharisees were even having Jesus over for meals, so food was being prepared on the Sabbath day, right? We need to preserve our own lives, but we also need to protect others, particularly those that are under our care. It's always right to love your family. It's always right to take care of your animals on the Sabbath. We don't have beasts of burden so much that we use. I don't think anybody here has a beast of burden, right? But we do have pets, and you wouldn't let your pets starve on, on the, the Lord's Day, would you? I mean, you, you feed them, and you're supposed to do that. Now, Jesus was not faulting the Pharisees for wanting to do that, right? But what he was faulting them for was not protecting everyone else, okay, for not rescuing their neighbors, others, others outside of their own little circle. They were not willing to rescue this man. This man with the dropsy had to suffer on the Sabbath day, even though Jesus was there and he could actually heal him. And again, that brings us to our second point, which is this, that our love needs to be a consistent love not just directed at one person or one small group. It needs to be directed to everyone. Now, why is it that the Pharisees were willing to help their own, but not this man? Okay, where was the disconnect that was going on in their minds? Well, the disconnect, of course, was in their hearts, right? Because this is the way sin, you know, basically affects us. It makes us think and behave in an irrational way. Even, well, in a hypocritical way. That's what rational is, right? It can make us see two things that are completely contradictory. Like, I should relieve the suffering of my children and my animals on the Sabbath because that's the loving thing to do. But I shouldn't relieve the suffering of my neighbor on the Sabbath because that would be work. Now, so you take these two things that, that are completely contradictory and you see them as reasonable and consistent and the thing that I ought to do. That's the reason why we often break God's law, because we're deceived by sin into thinking that something that is wrong is actually good, even when the Lord clearly tells me it's wrong, or not doing something good and seeing it as bad when He tells me it's good. We can look straight at what God says and come away with the exact opposite of what we should be doing. That's, again, the irrationality of sin. And I think their inconsistency becomes even clearer when we consider what they thought about Jesus, okay? They hated Jesus. Now, again, let's remember, what are the commandments all about? If we were to summarize all the commandments, how would we summarize them? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength and your neighbor as yourself. And you know that even when we're loving our neighbor, we're still loving God, aren't we? Because God is the one who tells us to love our neighbor and we're obeying the command God gives to us. We're loving him by loving our neighbor. But the Pharisees didn't want to love their neighbor. They hated their neighbor. They'd rather see this man suffer than be made well. And they hated God. This is the reason for their inconsistency. This is their sin. I mean, how do we know they hated God? Well, they invited him over for dinner, didn't they? And all they did while he was there was try to find some reason or some grounds by which they could put him to death. Jonathan Edwards once said that unbelievers are fallen man. You know, they may look like nice people. 
But if they could get their hands on God, if they could pull him off of his throne and kill him, that's what they would do. And, and we might ask the question, well, how do we know that's what they do? Well, it's because God actually became a man and dwelt among us. And that's what the unbelievers in his day did. They took him and they nailed him to a cross. Okay. Appearances can be deceiving. They hated God, and so they hated also their neighbor. Now, sometimes it might have appeared as though they did love God. But we need to understand that even when they did the right thing, they did it for the wrong reasons. Their affections, their love was really a self-centered love. Their love was directed towards somebody they cared about, somebody that maybe cared for them, right? Like their son who falls into the well. They would rescue that person because that son loves their dad, you know? Or they cared about them. Um, or they might show love to somebody that they expected to receive love from, but they wouldn't do it towards all their neighbors, especially not their enemies, and certainly not towards Jesus, who was actually their enemy. You know, the Bible tells us that all unbelievers have a certain kind of love, a love that is able to love those who love them, right? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? I mean, the sinners, the unconverted, the most hated among the society, I mean, they'll do the same thing. So what are you doing more than others? All unbelievers have this kind of love. They can go through the motions, but they can't love consistently. And they certainly can't um, keep all the commandments of God from the heart out of a genuine love for the Lord because they didn't have any. Jesus said to the Jews in John 5, 42, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves, which means they didn't have the power to love consistently because they didn't have, again, this love for God. That's the center. That's what we have to have in order to be able to keep the commandments, in order to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. But the point, of course, is they don't have it, but, but we do have it, right? God has given us His Holy Spirit through the work of His Son, as we were reminded of the last three Lord's Days, Father choosing, the Son coming and doing what was necessary to save us, the Spirit coming and uniting us to Jesus so His life flows through us, and He gives to us the heart of Jesus. He has given us His Holy Spirit, and with the Spirit, the new heart, the new affection that gives us the power to love our neighbor, Love is what enables us to do this. Remember what Paul says about love being uh, the fulfillment of the last six commandments. He writes in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, the reason why the six commandments, the last six commandments, is because those things are wrong to the neighbor. That's how you would wrong your neighbor. Love would not do that, okay? Love is the fulfillment of the commandment. It empowers us to love our neighbor and certainly, if it gives us the power to keep the last six commandments, it certainly gives us the power to keep the first four, which are summarized by the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all that is within you. Now, that means that we can do more than the Pharisees, right? We can love, we can do more than just love ourselves like the Pharisees did. We can also love others. We can do more than simply go through the motions, we can obey from the heart. We can do more than obey simply when it suits us. We can obey consistently because, of course, that's what love will move us to do. We can do this because the Spirit is working in us to make us more like Jesus. Now, remember, this, this is what the Spirit of God is doing, but we know there's an opposite principle in our hearts that makes it difficult to do this. We know that we're not going to be perfect in this life, as long as we have sin in our hearts, we are going to be somewhat 
inconsistent. We're not always going to keep all the commandments. We are going to fall sometimes. Sometimes we're not going to love our neighbors. We should, maybe often, okay? But we will be somewhat consistent, right? Because John tells us in 1 John 3 that those who are born of God practice righteousness. We will be reflecting the image of Jesus. There will be at least that much consistency in us to be able to see Jesus in us. But again, how are we going to see more of Jesus in us? How are we going to have a greater consistency in our love and in our obedience and our walk with the Lord? Well, we need fellowship with the Lord. We need to spend time with the Lord. So may the Lord remind us again this morning how important it is that we spend time with Him uh, on His day, not just on His day, but He's given us a whole day. And the purpose of this day is that we might, again, take a day off from work and spend it with Him. And again, He's not going to benefit from this. We're the ones who benefit from it. If we spend this day with Him, we will grow stronger in Christ. And if we grow stronger in Christ, in love, if we have more of the Holy Spirit, we will be more consistent Christians. We'll find ourselves living more as our Lord calls us to live. So may the Lord help us to see the value of this day and to use it for the purpose that He has given it to us. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to, to help us.